Hi, I'm Miss Hottie from Olympian High School. I'm going to be working with the Traditions and Encounters textbook to teach you about detente and the decline of superpower influence in the Cold War. So we'll use starting, we'll be starting on page 1081. First thing you want to remember is that who the two superpowers are. When we say the word superpower, we're talking about the United States, which represents democracy and capitalism, and the USSR or Soviet Union, which represents a system of communism. They, as you know, were engaged in an expensive arms race between each other, um, and they were trying to get different countries to align either with, you know, align with them, with themselves. So they're either aligning with the U.S. or the USSR. And um, we see this tension between them that there is a thaw in that tension in the late 1960s, early 1970s. So the word detente is another thing we need to know, which is just means a reduction in the hostility. So it's, um, it's a period of time when the USSR and the United States are um, working towards more um, cooperation, working to reduce the hostility, the antagonism between them. There will be two places where that's sort of that tension is still there. Um, and these are places that also contribute to a decline in superpower influence because there's an overextension um, by the superpowers. And these are military interventions in the United, uh, by the United States in Vietnam. And that's one. And then the second one is by the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So first, let's look at the, the thaw, the detente period. So remember, late 1960s, early 1970s, we have the United States and the Soviet leaders working together on a number of agreements. The most important agreement was the strategic uh, arms limitation talks, which were intended to limit the amount of nuclear weapons being produced. Um, so th that's a, a spirit of cooperation that we see in the 1970s. However, by the 1980s, there's a lot of tension that resurfaces between the superpowers. Um, one of the reasons for that was because the United States started to cultivate a friendlier relationship with communist China, who at that point, you know, they had used to have a positive relationship with the Soviet Union, but they were moving away from having a positive relationship with the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union felt like supporting China's communist government, the United States supporting Chinese uh, government um, was undermining them. Um, and undermining the U.S.-Soviet cooperation. The next situation that we're going to see is, um, well, let's let's look at first Vietnam and then Afghanistan. So um, in order to fully understand this, I, if I was a student, would skip ahead to Chapter 39 in order to look at what happens in Vietnam after World War II, because the book is a little confusing here. It kind of starts you off with the, it starts off in Chapter 38 with, what happens when the you know the Cold War, the superpowers, um, affects Vietnam? But it, you need to know what happened before that, even. And so, in Chapter Thirty Eight is where it tells you what happened in Vietnam after the World War II. So it's kind of chronologically out of order the way the book presents it. Very quickly, because I'm going to explain this again in Chapter Thirty Nine. I'll explain that uh, France, a great power, used to be an imperialist power. Um, had colonized Vietnam, the area called Vietnam. Um, then Japan came in and they, they took over Vietnam during, the, during World War II. When World War II ended, the French came back and tried to reassert control over Vietnam. The Vietnamese people are not going to be okay with this. There's a nationalist movement abreast here. There's a nationalist movement. They want their own country. And so basically they're going to defeat the French. And so the Vietnamese people defeat the French. French go back home, but then there's the issue of what happens to France. And the United States is heavily invested in making sure that communism doesn't spread here. They don't want more communism. And the Soviet Union, of course, wants a communist country. So this is a place where we will see the Cold War tensions play out. Now, remember, the Cold War is often fought through proxy uh, wars, and this is one of those proxy wars. So in Vietnam, nationalist communists, so these are communists, had installed themselves in the north. So think of North Vietnam as being mostly communist. And then there were basically um, d democratic nationalists in the south. And what we'll see is an escalation of involvement under the various presidents of the United States that ultimately leads to um, many U.S. Uh, troops serving and, and, and dying in, in this war. We are also going to see lots of civilians die. Early on in this conflict to later on in this conflict, most of the, most of the deaths, casualties will be civilians. We'll also see bombing in North Vietnam of civilians. And later on under Nixon, we'll see secret covert bombing as well.
Okay. One thing I want you to know is that the United States was um, um, fighting against the um, North Vietnamese and also communists inside South Vietnam called the National Liberation Front. But when you watch old movies about Vietnam, you'll see the U.S. soldiers often say denigratingly, the VC are coming or the VC. Um, that's the term that they used to refer to the National Liberation Front. It's a derogatory, derisive word. So Viet Cong uh, is what they called them. So basically, um, what we'll see is the um, escalation of this conflict as um, the United States is basically trying to prevent the communists from taking over the South. So let me just look here for a second. Let me see if there's anything that needs to be explained in this section. Um, yeah. So they're trying to prevent the North Vietnamese from coming from coming further south. The president uh, in 1968, Richard Nixon, he ran for president basically saying that he's going to end the war, pledging to end the war and to turn the war over to the Vietnamese. This is called Vietnamization. This is a term that sometimes comes up on, to, on the AP test. So make sure you know what it means. It means basically turning over the fighting to the Vietnamese people themselves. But when he got into office in 1968, Nixon is actually going to increase involvement in the war. Uh, one of the ways he did that was by secretly bombing Cambodia to, in the north, where he believed that many Vietnamese communists were hiding. Um, so this is going to cause a lot of problems. Um, you can read also about other things that he did trying to end the escalation of the war. But basically, m public opinion in the United States will turn against the war. You'll see this reflected in movies like um, Forrest Gump. Let's see if I can find that for you. So Forrest Gump, if you've never watched this movie, is a good one to watch. And you see this like you know anti-involvement uh, in Vietnam rally. This is a movie you could watch for extra credit if you're interested in, in extra credit. Um, make sure you get parent approval. So eventually, the U.S. is going to start to um, withdraw from the conflict. And the annoying thing is that they reach these, these Paris Peace Accords, and they basically create a line where, you know, the North is going to be communist, the South is going to be democratic. But within two years... The North invaded the South, conquered South Vietnam, and turned the entire country communist. So all of the deaths that resulted, it basically felt to many like this was a wasteful war that didn't really change the circumstances that the United States should never have been in. So this it depends on your perspective, but this is a controversial war. Um, but it resulted ultimately in Vietnam becoming communist anyway, despite U.S. intervention. Afghanistan is a situation where the Soviet Union overextended itself. So Afghanistan had remained aloof. They were not taking a side in the Cold War until 1978 when a pro-Soviet coup led to a basically a civil war that um, then installed a communist government in power, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. And this communist group went to work very quickly challenging, you know, some of the Islamic traditions and, and family traditions and bringing in more communist ideology. And this led to a backlash as some people felt like the social change was too soon and that it was disrespectful to um, traditions that were in Afghanistan prior to this. So these anti-government rebels start to attack the communist government in Afghanistan and the Soviet Union intervenes installing a Marxist named Babrak Karmal as president. And they try to back this guy up with civilian advisors, Soviet air. And um, at the same time that this is happening, this national resistance movement is spreading. And the United States, because of the context, historical context of the Cold War, is giving money and trying to assist anyone who's anti the communists. So on one side, you have the Soviet Union backing the communists. On the other side, you have the uh, United States backing the Mujahideen. These are Islamic warriors, Islamic who will later become Islamic extremists, some of them, who are fighting against the communists. So if you ever ask yourself, why would the United States support soldiers who were, you know, uh, motivated by, you know, Islamic ideology, 
it's because of the Cold War. So this is why it's really important to have a, an understanding of historical context. Many um, historians basically argue that later terrorist attacks by Islamic extremists were could ultimately be linked to this um, early instance of the United States and the CIA supporting um, Islamic Mujahideen. Now, this is controversial. Not everyone agrees with this. Not everybody sees this as a direct connection. So if you're thinking about, you know, how, how do we get to a place like 9-11, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, which we'll be discussing later, you want to go back and trace what was the United States doing early on and could this have had the effect of empowering people who were Islamic extremists later on. So just something to get your brain thinking about sort of the cause and effect relationships maybe um, between this. So the long story short is the United States and the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, were providing really important weapons, so ground to air stinger missiles, in order to shoot down Soviet helicopters and empower anyone that was anti-communist, including the Mujahideens. So um, eventually the Soviets who are backing up the communist government in Afghanistan replaced Karmal with somebody also who was unpopular, Mohammed Najballah, um, who had used to be in, part, in charge of the Afghan police. This is, he's still unpopular. This is, there's a huge resistance movement against it. Eventually the Soviet Union withdraws from Afghanistan in 1989. Once they leave, a civil war breaks out in Afghanistan between the different Mujahideen, the different factions within the Mujahideen, um, which of course are the Islamic soldiers. And this is partly the result of the diversity of Afghani people. And eventually in 1994, a really important group, you guys need to remember this for later when we talk about terrorism, um, a group called the Taliban is going to take power, capture the capital, execute Najibullah, and create an Islamic state of Afghanistan. Now, these two examples of Vietnam and Afghanistan um, show that the superpowers sometimes overextended themselves and that they, you know, weren't always capable of installing um, governments that they wanted um, for the reasons of the Cold War. And another effect of these situations is going to be mounting criticism culturally. So we'll see this um, through different films that are released, like Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. This is a film which presents um, the United States as, as uh, and, the, and the Soviet Union kind of mocks them as being full of, you know, unintelligent leaders that eventually are going to lead to the end of the end of the world through um, nuclear explosions. This is the ending scene of Dr. Strangelove. Stanley Kubrick is a famous um, uh, uh, filmmaker who also did Clockwork Orange. So again, if you're interested in these films, ask for, for permission from um, your parents and then ask for potentially the ability to do these, uh, review on these films for extra credit. Okay, so Dr. Strangelove is one example. You also see many, many students um, doing protests against the Vietnam War, for example, um, you also see, you know, people uh, going through mass demonstrations trying to promote peace uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, which is my alma mater. You see the free speech movement in 1964, um, trying to support free political expression. You'll learn about other types of student activism. You'll also see this counter uh, cultural sort of expression in music the popularity of rock and roll with a famous singer named Elvis Presley, who at that time was shocking people with his gyrations of his hips when he moved. This was, you know, back then it was a very conservative time. So he seemed very, you know, um, rock and roll. He was very, um, um, you know, um, kind of a rebel for that time. You also see songs by the Beatles and the Rolling Stones that, um, seem to be challenging the status quo, like, you know, songs like revolution and, Street Fighting Man. You also see um, sort of a disappointment and a disillusionment with political leaders. And one of the biggest examples of this was with um, President Nixon, who eventually has to resign. He's the only president who's had to resign. Um, president Nixon, during the war, during the Vietnam War, had secretly, covertly bombed Cambodia, where he believed that many Vietnamese communists were hiding. And this was leaked to the press, and I think it came out in the New York Times and eventually led to something called the Watergate scandal. Basically, he would, yeah, it was the New York Times. Basically, uh, Nixon was upset that these news leaks were happening, so he had had wiretaps placed on the phone lines of reporters and members of his staff, I think starting in 1971, since 1971, because he got reelected in 1972, despite this crazy scandal. 
anyway, basically there's going to be Nixon affiliated men who break into this complex called Watergate, um, basically trying to wiretap. I, I believe it's wiretapping some of the, um, uh, they're, they're trying to take different records and wiretap. And, and this leads to an entire investigation. Uh, the burglars that were there at Watergate get caught and it ends up the cover up of all of this gets linked back to Nixon, which leads to Nixon going on the air and um, saying that he's not a crook. This is like a famous part of his, his defense at Disney World. It's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Yeah. I've earned everything I've got. Okay, and then eventually he gets caught as being behind this scandal and has to resign. And this leads to um, a disillusionment with politicians. And um, basically, it also diminishes the prestige or lowers the prestige of the reputation of the Cold War superpowers, the United States and the USSR.